Welcome to Books on Point. Democracy Works asks how we can learn to nurture, deepen and consolidate democracy in Africa. This volume addresses the political, economic and extreme demographic challenges that Africa faces. It is intended as a resource for members of civil society as well as a guide for all who seek to enjoy the political and developmental uh, benefits of democracy in the world's poorest continent. To talk more about the book, we're joined by author Greg Mills. Greg, thank you so much for your time. So let's talk about what inspired you to write the book and to team up with uh, also some phenomenal partners as well? Well, a couple of years ago we did a book called Making Africa Work, uh, which was all about this enormous demographic challenge that Africa faces. It's an opportunity as well as we double our population over the next generation. And to do that we have to end business as usual. And when we wrote that book, yeah. We uh, went and extrapolated 25 years of African economic history since the end of the Cold War and tried to work out whether f the freer the countries, the more democratic the country, mm. the better they did or not in terms of economic performance. And we actually didn't know the result of that work until we'd done it. We had an idea that this was the case, that the freer the better. Mm. Um, but uh, we were delighted to find out that uh, not just for reasons of human rights and uh, conditions of safety and security where there's a correlation between democracy and yeah. those conditions but also in terms of economic performance and democracy there is a close correlation so in other words the freer the country and we use freedom houses classifications mm -hmm. of free partly free and unfree yeah. uh, the better the economic performance the the, the less prone co countries are to vulnerability and so on and then of course this begets the question is is how do you then ensure that democracies are not just about a single event and election yeah. how do you build the sorts of institutions and so this book following on from making africa work is a deeper study about trying to understand why democracy sticks in some countries mm -hmm. why it doesn't in others and what the outside world as well as in most most importantly africans themselves can actually do to nurture those conditions. In the beginning of the book, you highlight that over the years we are starting to see, in fact, even more recently, a lot more books that are centered around democracy. Does it then speak to the fact that perhaps democracy is vulnerable to populist ideas at this stage? I think absolutely. You know, the fact that uh, the authorship is joined uh, uh, in particular by Tendai Beatty, who has his own democratic experience, yeah. or not, uh, in Zimbabwe. Um, and in fact, the cover of the book is, is a picture I took at the MDC rally in the elections a year ago right. uh, in Harare just before the election. Um, and then, of course, President Abbasanjo, who has his own experience, he took over as a military head of state in 1976, uh, oversaw the transition back to democracy three mm -hmm. years later, and then came back after three and a half years in prison at the end of the 1990s as, as the uh, democratically elected president of, of, of Nigeria. We were interested in, in weaving personal experiences also with academic uh, um, uh, so studies and analytical work. Yeah. And I think what, what we see is, is of course there, is a, there are many dangers to democracy, there always have been, but overwhelmingly Africa is in a much better place than it was 30 years ago. Mm. In 1980 there were just two African democracies. Today more than 40 countries regularly hold multi-party elections. Of course some of those elections are flawed, we know that. Yeah. Um, they're very dodgy in, in many cases. Uh, but there are at least 10 countries which are classified as free by mm. Freedom House and 22 each in these partly free and unfree categories. And yes, there are constant dangers that citizens have to guard against. But perhaps the most important stat that one can remember uh, from, from this, and which is present in the book, mm. is that more than two-thirds of Africans today who are regularly polled by Afrobarometer prefer democracy to any other system of government. So yeah. whether it works or doesn't work, whether there are difficulties or not, it's overwhelmingly what Africans want. What about countries that argue, let's pursue economic development first and then democracy comes later? Because you, you highlight one of those countries, I think in chapter two, where we look at the case study of Rwanda, but we also compare it to Ethiopia as well and then use uh, Singapore to perhaps maybe even settle the debate. You've clearly read the book, which is a, a pleasure to hear. But um, yes, there is a sort of big man hypothesis that what Africa really needs is a sort of a, a benign democrat, uh, sorry, benign autocrat, a benign yes. authoritarian. Of course, that's a contradiction in terms. Authoritarians and dictators are not normally benign. Um, and, and we show conclusively 
uh, that the African authoritarian experience historically mm -hmm. has been very bad. So Democrats may not have performed as well as they have or should have uh, in other parts of the, of the world, uh, but Africa's authoritarians have done even worse. Mm -hmm. Now just to turn to the examples of Rwanda, now Rwanda has a very particular history. It's very aid dependent, uh, nearly half of its government budget is from aid. Uh, of course it's, it's transiting out of the genocide of 1994. Yeah. Um, the, the chances are that if you did have a, another authoritarian system, that you wouldn't get a Paul Kagame. Mm. In a sense, Rwanda's been very lucky to have an enlightened leadership. Uh, the, the, the great advantage of democracy is if you have a bad leader, a dud leader, you've got the opportunity to boot him or her out. What the Ethiopians, and this of course lauded as a great case study of, of um, the authoritarian development argument, what they have found over the last couple of years is actually the majority of of Ethiopians want democracy and the two issues development and democracy are inextricably entwined yeah. to quote the former Prime Minister Haile Miriam Deseleng who we interviewed as well as Abiy uh, uh, Ahmed who, who won the Nobel Peace Prize of course announced today um, uh, in, in, the, in the process of writing the book so the, the Ethiopians have actually gone off in a different direction mm. uh, contrary to the big man argument. Alright what do you want people to get out of this book when they pick it up on the bookshelf? I want people to realize that the health of a democracy is not up to somebody else. It's up to what they do. Mm -hmm. It demands a very active citizenry. It's much more than about just casting your vote on a single day. I think it was Justice Krichler who said only a fool or an idiot would rig an election on election day. The rigging happens in between. Yeah. The rigging happens when citizens are not alert and aware. And I think I want, would like them to realize, the authors would like them to realize, that democracy is an inherently much more competitive system of government and of governance in terms of policies. It gives people an opportunity to test their ideas at the polls. So I would say that one big idea is the future's in your hands, use your vote wisely and, and keep government, hold governments to account. Greg, let's leave it there. Thank you so much for your time. Thank well, you. our recommended book is by Deepak Chopra. And is it possible to venture beyond daily living and experience heightened awareness of your consciousness? Well, in his latest book, New York Times bestselling author Deepak Chopra says that higher consciousness is available here and now. He unlocks the secrets to moving beyond our present limitations to access a field of infinite possibilities. How does one do this? By becoming metahuman. Well, more news is up next with Nompumelelo Siziba at the top of the hour. Your weather details are up next.